This is section 24.7 and here we're going to see how uh, dipoles in a magnetic field uh, feel a torque. And uh, by dipoles I mean loops, magnetic fields, uh, etc. In um, the more general case uh, what we have is a, a current loop and it can be in this case uh, for to explain the origin of these forces we use uh, a square a square loop in which the current is flowing as shown by these uh, arrows and we have a magnetic field it's a uniform magnetic field that is uh, pointing in the z direction uniformly in this direction and uh, there is a pivot point that allows this loop to rotate around this point and this point. Uh, going by segments, we can find the force on each of the four sides. And for instance, like on uh, in the top, we, by pointing your thumb in the direction of the arrow here, in the, the direction of the current, and then bending the four fingers in the direction of um, the blue uh, field, we can see that uh, the force is going to be uh, directed to the top. So this segment here is going to feel a force that is up. Now, for the other case, since the direction is going exactly in the opposite direction, um, the force is going to be pointing down. The This length is the same as this length, and the current is the same on both wires. So consequently, this force is going to be exactly the same as this force. Now, for the sides, we have the current going up at this angle. And using your right hand, again, pointing the fingers in the direction of the current and bending them in the direction of the field, you can see that uh, there's going to be a force pushing this side to the positive x direction. For the other case, the other side, since the direction of the current is now reversed, the force is going to be equal in magnitude but pointing in the negative x direction. Altogether, we're going to, the, the whole loop is, will feel four forces, and one on top, one at the bottom, and these two. Now, it so happens that this along the pivot point are exactly anti parallel and they cancel. This one is of the same magnitude as this one, so there will be no net force along the y direction. But since this is at an angle, there's going to be a, a torque. And to see that, we need to draw it sideways. Here we have the same um, loop seen sideways. And when we can see that this force is not, is not along the same line, as this other force and consequently what's going to happen is that the loop will be forced to rotate in this direction clockwise as seen from this point of view now this is the pivot point and this will make it rotate now those rotations are basically a rotational force and, and they are known as torques a torque doesn't make doesn't make uh, the loop translate in direction in space but it makes it uh, rotate around the point and uh, to calculate the torques we have to calculate the torque uh, on on the top and the torque on the bottom and torques are calculated by the force that is applied times the um, distance to the point here so if we extend this one down, we need to find this distance here. So it's going to be this times the um, cos of the angle. And we get uh, the, uh, actually it's, uh, it's this distance here, the distance to the, um, the vertical distance to the pivot point is going to be this distance times the sine of the of the angle so we get um, 
Well, it would have been the cos of this angle, which is the sine of this other angle. So, it we get both terms and we, they can be combined into this. But uh, bottom line, it's much easier. Um, this this can be understood for this case in which we have a, a square loop. But in general, um, for any loop of any given area A, the whole thing uh, is going to be, will boil down to this expression where you have the current going around the loop, the area of the loop, the magnetic field, and the sign here. And that would be the torque. So it is much easier to calculate because uh, all we need is just the, the area of the loop instead of going through the actual geometry. Well, what uh, we have is um, that uh, for loops, whenever they are in a magnetic field, they're going to feel a, a torque. And it's basically because the this current produces a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is, um, is the one that interacts with uh, the external field, and forcing it to to have a uh, field uh, uh, rotational force. Now, the way that we represent this field that is being produced by the loop is with uh, an arrow, just a straight arrow pointing in the general direction of the field. And this is known as the magnetic dipole moment. And it is equivalent to the one that we use for the electric case. And the magnetic dipole moment, we say that it has a magnitude given by this product the current times the area of the loop and it is equivalent to something like this for a permanent magnet and to find the way that the rotation takes place we looked at the magnetic dipole this is the magnitude of the magnetic dipole and times um, the field and the sign of the angle between the magnetic dipole and the field and, and the direction of rotation is going to have to be um, uh, um, determined by examining the geometry. Like for instance, uh, to find the way that this is going to rotate, we need to look at the current. If we, you use your four fingers in the direction of this current, the thumb will give you the direction of this vector. So in this case, if you curl the fingers in this direction, of the right hand, of course, you're going to see that the thumb is pointing up, telling you that the magnetic dipole is up. If we had the opposite case in which the current was coming this way, then um, by curling the fingers in this direction, the thumb would be pointing down and the magnetic dipole moment would be down. So what we have now in this case is a magnetic dipole pointing up and the magnetic field pointing this way. And we can see that the angle between the two is 90 degrees and that gives you a 1 here, sine of 90 gives you 1. And then um, how is this going to rotate? Well, bottom line, the dipoles tend to get aligned with the field. So the dipole will rotate this way. If you want to see that in, in more detail, what you have to do is take a segment, for instance, this segment here, or rather this segment here in which the current is moving into the in, in that direction so you can see you can use your right hand to cross the direction of the current with the field and see what kind of a force it feels and it's going to feel a force down and this one is going to feel a force up and that tells you that this thing will rotate just like in i said before with the dipole moment aligning with the magnetic field We have here uh, three more examples. In this case, the, it would go this way. In this case, it would also go in the same direction. And in this case, it wouldn't feel a force because the angle between the two, uh, a torque, because the angle between the two would be zero and sine of zero gives you zero. So there's no torque. Of course, the maximum value of the torque it happens whenever this is one and this is one for 90 degrees so it would correspond to this this is the maximum torque 
and this is a medium sized torque and this is the minimum minimum uh, torque actually the minimum uh, properly speaking would be when this is minus one but uh, there would be you know with the uh, rotating it down well again there are two cases in which the torque is zero one is when the, the magnetic dipole is aligned with the magnetic field the angle is zero or when it is anti-aligned and it is 180. This one is uh, said to be stable because if you uh, wiggle it a, a little bit just make it uh, give it a, a little kick it will come back to the to this uh, position because it's the stable one is uh, the minimum energy but if you have it at 180 and you move it a little bit it will go to to zero degrees so it will rotate all the way and this is in one case in which is uh, anti-parallel it is um, similar to this case for instance we have uh, here the field is pointing the, the magnetic dipole is pointing down and the field is pointing up so the angle between the two is the magnetic dipole is pointing up the field is pointing down so the angle between the two is 180 here it would be equivalent to this case in which you're holding this mass with this rod here over this pivot point and imagine that it's static it's at rest but if you shake it a little a little it is clear that it will come down and as we will see next it comes down the same the same here comes down to the lowest energy value which is when this one is aligned with gravity just like here when the magnetic dipole gets aligned with the field the external field like this In this case this is stable I mean, if you shake it a little bit it will you know oscillate a bit and then lose energy and come down to this and here the same Well, as an example, uh, let us look at uh, this ring. We're showing the cross-sectional part of it. The current is going into the ring, this through here. Actually, it's coming out. Sorry, it's coming out from here, and it's going into the ring from here. So uh, if you use your right hand in circle in the direction of this loop, the current going this way, then you can see that um, the magnetic dipole is going to be pointing down and so you have the dipole down and then the field pointing this way so it will rotate counterclockwise again there is no no net force there is a torque Well, here we have a different case in which uh, we have two loops and loop one is fixed in space, but loop two can rotate. And um, the question is, how will it rotate? Well, obviously loop two is under the field produced by loop one. So we need to first determine the direction of the field produced by loop one on loop two. And then after that, we'll see how loop two rotates. Well, loop, um, one just by looking at the direction here you can use your right hand put your thumb in this direction and you're going to see that the field is coming from up here into this area and coming out so the field is coming out rotating around and then coming in again which means that here the field is in the in the upwards direction and by looking at the second loop we can see uh, if you curl your fingers in the direction of the current you're going to see that the thumb will be pointing in this direction from here to there which means that that is the direction of the magnetic dipole so we have the magnetic dipole pointing this way and we have the field pointing up 
so by looking at um, at that we see that the angle is 90 degrees and we see that this has to rotate like this how do we know that well you have to look at a little segment of the current and uh, cross it with the with the field and see that the force at that point is going to be to the left and if you repeat it here the point is going to be to the right so that makes the whole loop move in that counterclockwise direction If you take, let's say, a human being and put him in one of these big, very homogeneous magnetic field magnets, then there's a tendency of that magnetic field to line up the magnetic moments of the nuclei, the spin of the nuclei in the hydrogen in your body, which is in your muscle and in your blood. Now put on a radio frequency pulse, say 60 megahertz or something like that, then you can make this magnetization of your hydrogen nuclei, you can turn it 90 degrees away from the direction of the magnetic field. Your magnetic moment will precess. If you have coils around, pickup coils, they, it will induce a signal. If I want to see where the signal is coming from in your body, I put on another magnetic field on top of the very homogeneous one that's called a magnetic field gradient. By that I mean it makes the field stronger in one place and weaker in another place. What you do in order to actually get the image that you want, the fine resolution that you need, is you put on magnetic field gradients of different strengths, a series of pulses. That's why if you get an MRI machine, you hear boom, boom, boom. It's all these pulses that we're putting on with different strengths of magnetic field, perhaps even different directions because we want to get a three-dimensional picture of you. You record all of these data and when you finish you can now use what's called Fourier transform. It's a mathematical technique. You can work back to how strong the signal was in each of these uh, voxels. And so this is how the image is developed. MRIs use protons, which are abundant in the human body. All protons spin, creating a small magnetic charge. When a strong magnetic field is introduced, as is the case in an MRI machine, the protons align with that field. The MRI technician then introduces a radio frequency pulse that disrupts the proton and forces it either into a 90 degree or 180 degree realignment with the static magnetic field. Since the radio frequency pulse pushed the proton against its nature, once this pulse is turned off, the protons realign with that magnetic field, releasing electromagnetic energy along the way. The MRI is able to detect this energy and is able to differentiate various tissues based on how quickly they release energy after the pulse is turned off. of uh, how this radiation is uh, emitted when you have um, the magnetic dipole pointing one way and the magnetic field pointing in the opposite direction this is said to be in a high energy situation and if this one flips and it is it points down in the same direction as the magnetic field then the, it is said to be in a low energy uh, configuration the difference between the two is some energy here that when whenever this one falls down into this one this amount of energy gets released as radio waves and those radio waves are the ones that are used to make a map of where the radiation is coming and uh, all of this is related to the density and the density will be varying depending on the type of tissue the bone the muscle, etc.
and this is how uh, it looks basically a density map and it can be obtained by layers by tuning with the probes by tuning uh, for different frequencies we can it can be done by layers which gives you a three-dimensional view if, uh, if you reconstruct the whole information inside of a computer you can get uh, a three-dimensional view of uh, these objects An electric motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. A DC motor uses direct current electricity that flows continuously in only one direction around a circuit. A DC motor consists of an armature that rotates within a magnetic field. The armature has a coil of wire wrapped around an iron core. A source of electricity is connected to brushes, which make contact with the commutator on the armature. The commutator is a kind of switch that changes the direction of current flow in the coil as it turns. The electric current flows from the source to the motor and back to the source in one direction. The current carrying wires in the coil experience forces in the presence of the magnetic field. When current is flowing through the coil in the direction shown, the segment of wire near the south magnetic pole is pushed downward by the magnet. The segment near the north magnetic pole is pushed upward. In this way, the magnet causes the armature to turn. After each half turn, the commutator reverses the current. Forces on the coil reverse, and the turn is complete. The cycle repeats, making the movement continuous. Devices attached to the rotating armature shaft, such as pulleys and gears, can be used to perform any number of useful tasks. we have the same type of diagram and um, the problem with uh, this the, the reason why this commutator is needed is because under some circumstances we're going to have the current flowing this way and the torque is going to be is going to be making this side move rotate in this direction but as soon as this one passes um, to the other side then the force is going to be up again and it will make try to make it rotate in the opposite direction so when as soon as it goes beyond this point then the current gets inverted so that it flows in the opposite direction so that the rotation now is in the opposite direction as before it's in the same direction as before it continues down and it will allow this to keep on rotating now the armature is made out of many of these uh, loops organized in such a way that uh, you have one loop connected to, to the other one and so on. So you add up the, um, the, the torques of all the, those loops. We have here the loop inside of a magnetic field and um, the question is what is the direction of the current in this loop so that it rotates like this well we we can see it in uh, we can try to solve this problem in different uh, ways but first uh, let us agree that uh, the field is going to go from n to s so we have a magnetic field that is pointing in this direction from n to s so let's take a segment here in this segment imagine the current is going into so there's an x here if that's the case then we have the um, you're, you're going to have to place your four fingers in the direction of the screen and turn them in the direction of the of the field and that should give you your thumb should be pointing down which tells you that it cannot go or the current cannot go in this way but it has to come out from there 
if it comes out and you use your four fingers pointing out of the screen and then bend them in the direction of uh, the field the thumb is going to be pointing up in which makes it rotate like we want to so um, so the current is going to be pointing is going to be coming uh, out which uh, um, to get the answer here we're going to have to to decide whether that is clockwise or cl counterclockwise and if you see it from the top it's going to be counterclockwise again we have uh, this the loop rotates counterclockwise what is the loop uh, equilibrium's position well in this case the magnetic dipole is going to be aligned with the magnetic field and consequently there will be no torque this is the end of section 7 and uh, this is the homework but um, we're going to skip section 8